It's a, a new little series we've got called My Five Favourite. And John, you've agreed to, to list your five favourite Dire Strait songs. Now, as you said, it's not an easy thing to do. There's, there's certainly a load of songs that you guys have worked on over the years and you've played most of them live and, and they, they resonate so much with fans and the audiences, both young and old as well. So these songs are, are personal to you. These are your choices, your your collection of tracks that, that mean something to you and and really stand out amongst the Dire Straits collection. So let's start with with number one. What was the first song you, you chose from your from five? I, I think it was Wild West End. For me, it was um, uh, a recollection of that time when Mark and I were hanging out a lot, uh, um, not only at the flat musically, working things out and he was writing and all this, but we used to make regular visits up to the uh, to the West End to, um, you know, Soho. And Soho in 1976 was a little different than it is now. Um, you know, it was a bit more edgy. There was a lot of, uh, you know, um, sort of clubs and, um, you know, uh, sort of strip joints and stuff like that. So we used to go up there and, because we enjoyed that edginess of the place, but also because there were some wonderful guitar shops up there where we could uh, drool in the windows at things that we couldn't possibly afford. <laughs> and so we used to go up there and have a have a bowl of pasta at, uh, you know, um, the Barocco Bar and go and get coffee from Angelucci's. And, and it, it's a lovely memory for me of that that beginning of Mark and, Mark and I's friendship, I think, really. So... I've always had a very soft spot for it. In fact, actually, I'm going to play it at a gig in two weeks' time um, uh, because it brings back a, a really lovely memory of that relationship with him developing and um, and it stood the test of time. So uh, that's the reason I've chosen that one. And it, it's a, well, Mark's obviously a wonderful storyteller and he paints pictures with his words and this is a, a really good early example of that, isn't it? Yes, I mean, I think storytelling is the essence of good songwriting, unless you just want to sing about love and hate <laughs> and, uh, you know, that kind of personal, really personal stuff. I, and this is a personal thing, but it's telling a story about, you know, build, yes, building a picture of, of, a, of a time. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, a very good craft. So, I mean, I've, I, you know, I've, I've learned a lot from his writing and, um, I mean, long way back, for instance, from the new album is painting a picture of when we first went to L.A. So I understand that way, that that approach to uh, trying to communicate something to somebody else, you know, in, in a unique way. So it's it's a talent, but it's something that I think you one can learn, you know, over a period of time. So while we're stand is. You know, an example, a perfect example of very early storytelling. Well, actually, if you listen to the whole first album, it's it's about it's a story. I think that's probably why people tend to sort of latch onto that as being because it is. I don't really think about it in these sort of terms, but people say to me, "Well, that really is the seminal kind of Dire Straits record because it, it at the very beginning it showed the sort of um, the energy that the band had." Absolutely. So Wild West End, that was the first choice. Uh, your second choice is another one off that uh, debut album as well, isn't it? There's a there's a thing. Um, you know, the six-blade knife is a Swiss army knife, as you probably know, which has got all the necessary things on it. The most necessary one, of course, being a corkscrew to open a <laughs> bottle of wine and, and a little thing that takes the cap off a, you know, off a tin. Uh, it does a feast of things, the six blade knife. So I've got two or three of them actually, um, quite old ones because I had one very early, and I think Mark bought me one uh, in in that first time. And so here's another example of using uh, an article like that, and and then you know relating it to a relationship. Uh, you know, you take away, uh, you take away the like you take away my heart, like you take away the top of a tin. You know. So, I mean, I can't remember the exact words now. Of course, I've forgotten them, naturally. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the, a synonymous sort of idea about a, a relationship and uh, and a tool, you know, a knife, you know. Um, so it, it's very clever. And I've always loved the really s the simplicity of it is so 
easy. And it, funny enough, it's my daughter, Dee Dee's, one of her favorite Dire Straits songs. She plays it constantly, even though she listens to music all the time. Every time she comes to the house, she, I can hear it in her room just playing. Yep. Um, it sort of plods along rather nicely, but it's just a very sweet and sort of simple way of expressing an idea. Yeah, I like that because it is, it's, it's a rather sparse song. It, it proves that you don't have to overplay. It, it just kind of fills nicely and, and rolls nicely. It's a bit like, it always reminds me of Dreams by Fleetwood Mac, that kind of thing, that kind of rolling yes. Beats and yes. things, and yeah, definitely. Well, I think you've just you've touched on a on something there. I think the the early feeling of the band was on that simplicity. What you can do with two guitars and a bass and a drum kit, uh, and if you can make that work, well, actually, a good song should be able to play. You can play it on an acoustic guitar, but you know when you when you've just got a four piece, you have to. Uh, everything's a bit simpler. There were very, very few overdubs on that first record. Mm. Yeah, and most of it was played live and um, just with, you know, obviously the vocals were done afterwards and the car harmonies and stuff like that and a bit of tidying up, a bit of lead guitar work, but principally, you know, um, yeah, it was very, very simple. Yeah, and two songs you've picked from your, your top five that have come from that um, first record. Yeah. It's a silly question, but obviously it's something that you look back on fondly. Uh, very much so. I think it w well. It was the first time we'd actually ever been in a grown-up studio. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, we we didn't really pathway was very small. <laughs> Pathways, well, they're so small you can only get two people in the in the uh, in the mixing room. You know, the recording. Uh, um, yes, it, it was. You know, it was, it was wonderful studio, Basing Street, just off Portobello, um, and. Um, Yes, I think that uh, just being together in a in a place where you could really hear what you were doing, uh, the sound coming back from you seemed to be better than the sound you were making, if you like, <laughs> because the equipment it was very top drawer and and of course Muff Winwood did a wonderful job of producing it and Brett Davis, a great engineer. We we had a we had a very good team, and they basically. Muff Winwood would say to us, right, guys, I can hear how simply you play. Please don't overcomplicate it right now. Just keep it really simple. And uh, and that's, so that's what we did, and that's what the album is. It's, very, it's a very simple uh, uh, acknowledgement of where we were at that particular time in 1977. Fantastic. Right, we're going to jump through a couple of uh, records now and go to Making Movies for your third choice. And this one was was a big hit it was a top 10 single in the uk and you talk about simplicity it is another kind of stripped back song but it is very complex in its in its playing and wordplay as well it's a it's a great song so so what is choice number three then john well romeo and juliet um uh, and i chose this really because you're right it's it's it seems on the surface to be a very simple um simple song but in fact actually I've played it with quite a few people, and now in my band, I've got people who really understand how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's got a lot of subtleties in there which are not obvious at any one time to a lot of people who hear it and tend to miss the dynamic, the very subtle dynamic in that song. And, and of course, it's a love song, and it's a frustrating love song, and... Um, I, I don't I don't even know, and I don't really want to think about what Mark was going through at that particular point in time. It might have been a reflection of where he was at. I knew him pretty well, but I didn't know everything. And uh, so I would imagine it was either fictitious or with a bit of, you know, personal um, personal history there. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is it's, uh, you know, as soon as people hear that song, I can hear a sort of murmur in the audience and they go, oh, yes, we really want to hear this. And, I, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of work, even though I say it myself. Um, <laughs> the, um, and I just, I adore playing it. I adore, I adore singing it. And I've got a lovely girl in the band called Hannah Robinson who is a singer-songwriter in, in her own right, and she will be known at some point. 
and I get her to sing the second verse. Oh, and everybody really? afterwards says, oh, that girl of yours, she's got a fantastic voice. And I think, <laughs> yes, she has. She's the only one in the, in the band with a fantastic voice. <laughs> but, um, and they really pick it out because she sings it with such tenderness. Um, and I recommend that to anybody if they've got a girl in the in their in their band to let them sing the second verse. But anyway, yes, it's a very, it's it's a it's a it's a wonderful song. I, I, and I heard I remember the very first first time that I heard it. Mark came to my place in Forest Hill, uh, house in Forest Hill. I bought and I was we and he he bought his National Steel guitar around and he tuned it in a very strange way. And everybody knows who's tried to play that song will know that the tuning is interesting and actually. It's actually quite a difficult thing to play, yeah, for any guitar player, and a lot of them just give up. It's a very, very interesting piece of guitar playing, which when you see Mark playing it, it looks like it's water off a duck's back. But in fact, actually, it's very tricky, and a lot of people have been defeated by it. Dare I say? But he came and he played a very, very raw version of that to me, and I just looked at him and I said. That's just fantastic. That is one of the best things I think I've heard you uh, you make, mate. That's that's just wonderful. That's going to be so great to record. And I was right. It, you know, it was it, it. It really, it's meant a lot of a lot to a lot of people. I think somebody said one day, "I wonder how many babies have been born or created from Romeo and Juliet." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving right along, yeah, we will uh, leave that one there. Uh, just quickly discussing the period around that. Then, obviously, it was a period of change because David left during the making of the, that record, and and um, Hal and Alan Clark joined for for the tour and things like that. The band was evolving; it was changing. How was how was the feeling within the group at this stage then? Because obviously you'd had success from the previous records and this was another great album you'd just recorded. So how was the how was the feeling within the group with with the dynamics changing? Well, it's a it's a it's a sad thing, but the, you know dynamics in bands do change, and uh, you know it's it's very rare for a band to start off as a four piece and end as a four piece. Um, it was a very difficult time. Uh, I dealt with it in the book uh, in the best way I could because I, you know, I, I was very friendly with David, and obviously Mark was a very, my great mate, and so it was very difficult to deal with that situation um, uh, in many ways. Um, but uh, in a sense, the band really didn't have any alternative. The only way that the band was going to move forward and and do what it could really do, which we you know, uh, we did, uh, was by, uh, unfortunately, David leaving. And, and uh, it was a very sad day for me, a sad day for Mark as well, that that didn't work out. Uh, but, you know, that's life. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, it happens, these things. It certainly do. Right, let's go on to choice four then. And this this certainly is an epic. We're going to Love Over Gold now. Yes, uh, this was quite a, quite a song to... Um, to get together uh going back to the making movies uh time when we toured making movies we actually during the sound check of uh making movies we um you know we we actually spent the time getting a telegraph road together it's okay. obviously a lot of piano work with alan clark and, and mark together and then getting all those different dynamics um in 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 the music because it's obviously we know it's very long and it's 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 there again. It's another. It's a story. You know, we're telling a story about that. You know, that road in America. <laughs> I think it was uh, in in uh, around Detroit or something. Uh, I can't remember exactly. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, uh, I think the idea came from idea. Maybe it originally came from a book. I, 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 but I don't know. But anyway, so he, he you know he developed this whole kind of nature. This this idea of the growth of America and this long road and the Telegraph Road and all the rest of it and. Uh, wonderful yet again another wonderful piece of writing and and uh, it took a long time to get that together but we used the sound checks as i say in, on the making movies tour partly to stop ourselves getting bored but because we needed to get this this song and a few other songs together for the next record because at that time the work intensity was was phenomenal we didn't really stop at all mm -hmm. uh and so you know you toured and you, you then you went almost you took a couple of weeks off and then or three and then you went straight into recording again and then you organized the next tour and and so on and so on and so on. So this was you know, we had to work on these songs uh while we were on the road. 
So when we got to the power station in New York, New York, we were ready to put that song down. And you know, recording a fourteen-minute song, let me tell you, in one crack is is quite quite an experience. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of the the last four or five minutes, then I mean, what? How is that as a musician when you're on stage and you you've, you've gone through nine, ten minutes of the song and you get to this last four or five minutes and it really is a big jam? It must be really fun as a musician to to, to feel that energy and and really get to play that last bit. Oh my god! I mean, I used to look forward to that every single night, and I think we captured it on Alchemy. Yeah, um, I think that was quite a that was a, a, the band was really hot at that particular point in time on that alchemy tour and uh well that, i think there was a yes it was the uh, making movies tour um and uh, yeah that version i think of telegraph is pretty phenomenal i mean you're quite right towards the end when it starts to really motor you know after that you <laughs> you you had to play something a bit quieter and a bit slower <laughs> but I absolutely, I used to look forward to that every night, and especially at the end when we started building the thing up and it just gets more and more and you think, and Mark's guitar playing at that particular moment was was just quite phenomenal. I mean, it, I look back on it now and I think, oh my God, I, I, sometimes you get so used to things happening. But when I go back and listen to that, I'm thinking, it's just phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal guitar playing. Quite extraordinary every single night this musicianship of unparalleled energy really uh and that's why people used to come and watch the band playing live because it was bloody good <laughs> it certainly was it certainly it was, was. Good, you know yeah we prided ourselves on doing good concerts and you know satisfying a lot of eager ears <laughs> you certainly did that and you mentioned that after playing that song that you had to play something a little bit quieter and that's moving us on to, to choice number five now um i spoke to you i think it was maybe three or four years ago now and i pinned you down to your favorite dire straits song and it's it's no surprise that this one uh made the list you, you said it was an almost perfect song that that mark had written so you, you, your choice for, for number five comes from the brothers in arms album yes well i i think that most dire straits uh uh, aficionados would rank this pretty high. Um, Brothers in Arms is a uh, uh, an attempt to, if you like, uh, open people's eyes and minds to the frustrations and horrors of, uh, you know, conflict uh, and how we try and deal with it. I mean, we're in one right now, although it's now sort of on the second page of the bloody telegraph or something. You know, this business of people just disagree about things and 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 start hurting each other. And uh, I, I find I still find it really difficult to comprehend that we haven't really moved on very much over the centuries. There's there's still megalomaniacs and idiots who think they can change the world to the better and it basically makes it worse essentially um so brothers in arms it, it, i find it i always find it very emotional to play it even now i've played it thousands and thousands of times and i make no excuse for uh, the other day i finished off a concert with it and um yeah it it and it's a it's an interesting thing when you because most people finish a concert and I often do with something hard and fast and you know so everybody's on their feet with their hands in the air and I think I made no apologies I said I'm going to finish this concert with this song because I think it still has resonance and an important sort of uh, message to the to the world still and I think it will forever yeah dare I say I think it's you know there are some artworks that are on the wall that you know, people recognize as being significant uh, aspects of um, human integrity. And I think Brothers in Arms fits into that with, you know, in the in the musical world. And how soon into the recording of, of the entire record was it decided that, um, that that song and the title itself stood out so much that it had to be the, the name of the record itself? I think it was pretty obvious right from the start, actually. You know, um, because in a sense, brothers in arms is a is a is a term, a colloquial term for people being together and 
you don't not particularly in conflict, but um, I, I I do know that it's it's the signature tune of the armed forces when they're away. I mean, they they play it a lot, and I've had messages, and I, I suspect Mark has too, from a lot of ex army guys. I mean, I've had a ride back in a taxi the other day in London, and he was talking about this that his when his time in Iraq and all the rest of it, and there he is driving a cab. And he said, you know, I said, did you ever listen to music? I thought I'll just tease him a bit. I said, did you ever listen to music while you were over there? And he said, well, yes. I mean, we listened to Brothers in Arms a lot because it meant so much to us at that particular time where we were. And I said, well, I played the bass on that. And he almost jammed his foot on the brake, to, you know. Um, and we had a little chat about that. And um yeah, it was quite an emotional moment, actually, hearing his stories of being over there and leaving his family at home and the danger he was in and all the rest of it. I mean, I really felt for him. And, but then that song, you know, resonated with him. I can relate to that. My, my father went to the Iraq War as well. He was in the army. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Me. Yeah. What? Um, uh, in terms of the, the record itself, it was recorded um, in Montserrat, wasn't it? Like, out in the Caribbean, you told me before the stories about that yeah. and all sort of stuff. But in terms of this track itself, um, you were recording digitally at this point. It was a very new technology. And did that help with this, this track, especially with the, the, the eerie buildup and everything at the start? I think that um, whether it would be digital or analog, I wouldn't I think it would have made much difference, actually, to be honest. Um we were experimenting with digital recording, uh, which was very, very new at that particular point in time. So we weren't really, um, the, and then we got a, a dodgy bit of uh, batch of tape uh, at one moment, so which was very awkward because it, we lost a lot of uh, the initial parts of the recordings at one time. So, you know, it wasn't perfect. But now, obviously, it's just, it's all logic and computers and all the rest of it there's, there's no tape anywhere but this was digital tape which you, you could record about 150 tracks on and it was you know quarter of an inch or something uh so anyway i think i think that, yes that we were experimenting a lot with that record digitally recording it and um uh you know going to montserrat was was a wonderful experience obviously sadly it's no longer there um because of the hurricane and the volcano and everything else uh just about everything thrown at it but um so um uh yes i mean and then finished we finished it off in in the power station in new york um uh, again and um yes i mean i think the sound of it is pretty i mean we spent a lot of time trying to get the sound right on that record and thankfully we had great engineers and a good a good you know good we we spent a lot of time on it. I think that we knew when we were putting the songs together that we had to get this one right because we, you know, we had four albums out and they'd all been pretty successful, actually. And then, um, so we had an audience out there. So I think that, you know, there was an interesting group of songs on there. I mean, some people say, well, there was a pop song on there as well, which is Walk of Life, of course. Uh, and... Uh, there was a debate at one point whether we put Walk of Life on their record. Yeah, and, I, and I, I put my hand up and said, "Look, it's an antidote to, you know, Brothers in Arms and and all the other serious stuff on there." And this, and, and I think that you know it would really show the level and the depth of uh, what we can do. So, and there was there was a, a general agreement. I think one of the engineers said, "Oh no, you can't possibly put that on there because it's not serious enough and all the rest of it." Well. <laughs> What did he know? Um, exactly. Anyway, um, you have to take chances in this life, you even with something like walk of life. <laughs> <laughs> you do indeed. Well, John, it's been an absolute pleasure listening to to your choices and the reasons behind them. Absolutely fascinating to to hear some of the stories behind these great songs. And just a quick recap: There's Brothers in Arms, Telegraph Road, um, Romeo and Juliet. We've got Six Blade Knife and Wild West End in there as well. Thank you so much for joining us today, John. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, my pleasure. Nice to talk to you again.